In September of 1777, the Revolutionary War was dragging to its third year. Despite having achieved many successive battlefield victories over the Americans, the war was not progressing well for the British. After Washington's victories at Trenton and Princeton, the British had been forced to withdraw from southern New Jersey, ceding it to the Patriots. The British retained control over just a small area of their colonies. They held Lower New York, Northern New Jersey, and Canada. Commander of the British forces, William Howe, sat with the main British army in Manhattan, while Commander Washington and his army were encamped in Pennsylvania. They were guarding the American capital at Philadelphia, where the Continental Congress had been meeting since its inception. Meanwhile, in Britain, the British command were developing a plan to reclaim control over the colonies and snuff out the rebellion. General John Burgoyne, known as Gentleman Johnny, formulated the plot. He would lead a large British army down from Canada to meet the American forces at Saratoga. As he marched towards Saratoga, Howe's army would contemporaneously march north along the Hudson River. The Hudson River runs along all of New York's eastern border and was wide enough that a fleet could be used to transport all the troops from Manhattan to Saratoga without much risk of being intercepted by the rebels. With their overwhelming numbers, the British would easily destroy any American resistance that they might face and could easily reach Saratoga before Washington's force could make it there from Pennsylvania to reinforce the battle. Once Saratoga was captured, the colonies would be split in two by the Hudson River. Thus, the area of New England would be separated from the rest of the colonies. New England was where the rebellion had begun, and it was where patriotism was the fiercest. The rest of the colonies had large groups of loyalists who would likely join the British in resisting the Americans. The plan was simple in execution, yet cunning and crafty in concept. Burgoyne was very in touch with the American mindset, and will perhaps warrant a video of his own in the future. There's a very strong possibility that it would have succeeded, except for one factor. General Howe was not on board with the plan. And while this might not have been enough to torpedo the plan on its own, the manner in which Howe conducted himself would put the entire British war effort at risk. Without informing any of the British officers, including Burgoyne, Howe decided it would be better to attack Philadelphia and seize the American capital. So while Burgoyne marched south, believing he would meet Howe at Saratoga, Howe was in fact marching in the opposite direction. Howe was operating under the European principles of war. He believed that once an enemy capital was seized, the country would be forced to, forced to capitulate. It's much the same as how Napoleon conducted his war. However, one will recall that when Napoleon reached Moscow, instead of surrendering, the Russians burned the city to the ground. Washington, however, was not intending to let Philadelphia suffer that same fate. He moved his forces with all haste and prepared to defend the city. The two armies would meet and give battle at Brandywine Creek. The coming battle for America's capital would be the largest and deadliest of the revolution. Howe brought with him 260 British ships and 17,000 British infantry and Hessian infantry. Meanwhile, Washington commanded 21,000 Continental soldiers and American militia. This is Grim Battaglia, and you're watching my series on Battles of the American Revolution. And this is the Battle for Philadelphia, the defense of Brandywine Creek. Howe initially attempted to draw Washington into a battle in northern New Jersey, thinking he could defeat Washington and then still make it to Saratoga to reinforce Burgoyne. However, Washington did not take the bait. Instead, Howe was forced to put his men on a fleet and sail to the Chesapeake Bay and land just outside of Baltimore. He would then follow the main road towards Philadelphia. Washington, knowing he had to act fast to save the capital, looked for an area to make his defense. He noted that the main road crossed over an area known as the Brandywine Creek. There were only a few crossings over the creek, and attacking over a river is extremely difficult. So it was here Washington decided that he would set up his fortifications make his defenses, and prepare to try and save the American capital. Washington prepared his defenses. He deployed his men at Chad's Ford, Brinton's Ford, and Jones's Ford, the only three fords he was aware of that crossed over the Brandywine Creek. His plan was to force the British to march and try and cross Chad's Ford, which he would heavily fortify in order to repel any British advance. Washington's plan was sound, but he lacked one important piece of information. There were in fact two more places that one could cross the ford, and British loyalists had informed General Howe of both of them. The British could cross at Buffington's Ford and Jefferson's Ford, circumventing the American forces in a giant flanking maneuver. 
Those following this channel will remember the Battle of New York, where Howe executed a similar maneuver against Washington. Washington had defended along the main area of the Brooklyn Heights. Howe sent two diversionary attacks at the American forces, while he took his men the long way around the American defenses and flanked the American position. The flank was extremely successful, routing the American forces and forcing a full retreat of Washington and the Continentals towards Manhattan and eventually forcing them out of New York entirely. Washington positioned his armies to defend the three forts of which he was aware. He placed a smaller force at Jones Ford and Brinton's Ford, where he placed his ma main force at Chad's Ford, where he predicted the British attack would occur. He then had his men fortify the hills along the eastern bank of the river, further strengthening the Americans' defensive position. He placed Commander Sullivan in charge of the northern force and General Green in command of the main force, while Washington himself would oversee the entire battle from the rear. The British army split into two forces. Cornwallis would lead 9,000 men on a 17-mile flanking maneuver, crossing the two fords which Loyalists had informed him of, and circumventing the American defenses to hit them in the rear. Meanwhile, a force of 7,000 British soldiers would attack directly over Chad's Ford. This attack, however, was merely diversionary. It was intended to hold the Americans' position while Cornwallis and his men completed their long, circumventing, flanking maneuver. On the morning of September 11, 1777, a large fog spread around the Brandywine Valley. The British used their advantage and moved into marching formation. Around 5.45 a.m., they began their advance. Their movements were concealed, and conflicting reports led Washington to believe the main attack would be at Chad's Ford. A group of American troops intercepted Cornwallis' men around 10 a.m. They chased them for about an hour, harassing them as they marched. By 11, they realized they were fighting the rear of a massive flanking force and retreated back towards the main army body to inform Washington of the development. Unfortunately for Washington, the American force had been nearly 8 miles away from the main body, and it would take them until nearly 2 p.m. before they could relay the message. Meanwhile, the other British body was met by American skirmishers, and they held the British off for a brief while before being forced to pull back. They were primarily engaging the Queen's Rangers, which was the British division comprised completely of American loyalists. After defeating the American skirmishers, the British diversionary force continued their advance. Outside of the Kennett Meeting House, they met a larger contingent of American forces. The two gave battle, and the British took many casualties, but eventually they were able to push the Americans back all the way to a hill outside of Chad's Ford. At this point, the fog began to clear from the battlefield, and the main battle was poised to begin. The Americans attempted to defend a fortified hill on the west banks of the creek. However, they were badly outnumbered, and despite causing the British some casualties, they were forced to retreat, ceding their position and artillery to the British. The British force then positioned its artillery on the hills along the western bank. They kept their men hidden behind the crest of the hill. The Americans attempted to engage them with an artillery barrage but were largely ineffectual due to the British's protected position. The commander of the British forces knew that he only had to buy time while Cornwallis' men completed their flanking maneuver. Between 12 and 2 p.m., the two forces skirmished for control of the Brandywine. Eventually, the Americans decided to launch an offensive attack. They led their men over the breach towards the British position, but from the fortified hills, the British were able to easily push the Americans back to their side of the creek. By 2 p.m., the Battle of Chad's Ford was in a stalemate. Scouts from the force that engaged Cornwallis' rear finally made it to the main army and informed Washington of the large flanking force headed his way. At the same time, Cornwallis' army had finally made it over both fords and was situated around two miles north of the American position. They stopped for around two hours so that the men could rest and replenish after their grueling seven-hour march through the hot Pennsylvania countryside. This gave the Americans time to formulate a defense. Sullivan was placed in charge of defending against the flanking army. American forces were stripped from the three fords and sent north to fortify a hill overlooking the British position. At around 4 p.m., the British began their advance. The Americans held their ground against the British at the hills. From their position on the hill, they were able to barrage the British with direct artillery fire. The British were taking heavy casualties, but continued engaging the Americans nonetheless. On the American left, Sullivan was forced to depart from the Americans directly under his command so that he could join the commanders at the hill to coordinate the entire defense. At this point, British troops were able to outmaneuver Sullivan's men and launched a small flanking attack on them 
catching them by surprise. Sullivan's men were forced to retreat, ceding the American ground left of the hill to the British. The American forces were clearly in the superior position. They controlled the high ground atop the hill, and with their artillery, they were able to fire unopposed on the British as they marched across the open field. However, despite this, the British bravely continued to push forward. They were led by Commander Cornwallis, who was one of the most respected commanders in the entire British army, and the troops under him would not fall too easily. They had much faith in his ability to lead. Furthermore, the British were comprised of their elite guard unit, the feared Hessian mercenaries, and the grenadiers, whose skill with the bayonet was feared by all American units. For the next two hours, the two forces bitterly fought for control of the hill. Though the Americans had a superior position, they impressed all by managing to hold the field for hours along the skill of the British Army. It was clear that their training under Washington was slowly but surely starting to pay off. 6 p.m., and after two hours of fighting for the hill, the sun was beginning to set. The Americans on the left side of the hill observed Sullivan's forces being routed. They began to lose morale and feared being surrounded themselves. When the British pushed their advance, the Americans on the left side of the hill broke and fled. Despite this, with the aid of artillery, the Americans on the right side of the hill continued to hold their position and fight off the British assault for nearly an hour. With the far left of the American defenses at Chad's Fort exposed, the British decided to advance and take that flank rather than aid in the assault on the hill. The Americans at the fort turned and defended against the new British threat. The commander of the diversionary force realized that the American position was being overran. He ordered an artillery barrage to begin, and the two sides began to show each other. While the British infantry moved up, they began firing across the creek. Then, the force stormed across Trad's ford and began to push the Americans from their position. Back on the hill, a force of elite light infantry forced the American right to withdraw. At the center, a bayonet charge by the British grenadiers forced another retreat. A future hero of the war, General Lafayette, arrived and tried to rally his men against the retreat, but he was quickly wounded. Still, his efforts paid off as he turned what may have been a rout into an organized retreat, thus avoiding disaster. Realizing that the American defense was failing across the line, Washington and General Knox agreed to move some artillery to the north and attempt to delay the British advance so that the main army could retreat. The Americans were nearing disaster. A rout could cause the entire army to be destroyed, and it had to be prevented at all costs. South of the hill, Knox positioned himself with a small contingent of Americans in order to buy time for an organized retreat to come underway. Knox and his contingent of men held off the British with their artillery position. They gave another contingent of the army, led by Sullivan, time to set up another line of defense at Dilworth Field, just south of the hill. The men at Knox's position were eventually overrun, but they'd served their purpose and bought time. The men under Sullivan bravely stood their ground against the British's overwhelming numbers, while they bought time for the rest of the army to continue the retreat. As the sun began to set, the men at Dilworth broke off and joined in the retreat. Much of the valuable American artillery had to be left behind, since too many of the horses had been killed during the battle. However, with the onset of night, the British were unable to pursue the American army, and the Americans were able to escape with their army still intact, avoiding complete disaster. The battle was both the largest and deadliest of the revolution, and with the American defeat, the British had an open road to the capital at Philadelphia. The British suffered nearly 600 casualties, while the Americans suffered over a thousand. The Americans additionally lost control of over 10 artillery pieces, which were extremely valuable to their army and difficult to replace. Following the battle, the American army continued to skirmish with the British in an attempt to prevent them from taking Philadelphia, but they were repeatedly defeated. Nearly a month later, Washington, seeking to liberate the capital, launched an ambitious attack on the British at Germantown, one of the first full-scale battles of the war to be initiated by American aggression. Though his army was ultimately defeated, it was another costly battle for the British, and the Americans' ability to hold the battlefield at both Brandywine and Germantown convinced many in Europe that the Americans could win the war. Following their defeats, Washington's forces were forced to encamp at Valley Forge for the winter. There, they endured one of the harshest winters of the entire campaign. They were joined by a man known as Marquis Lafayette, who by all accounts helped inspire the men to endure the winter
and helped to rigorously train the army so that the next time they engaged the British, there'd be an untrained, undisciplined rebel force no more. With Howe's victory, he was able to capture Philadelphia. However, this did not have the effect that he desired. The American Congress had simply packed their bags and left the city before Howe's arrival. While in Europe, the capture of a capital may destroy a government's ability to pursue war and force a surrender. This was not the case for the Americans. Their government was simply too small, and the capture of their capital did not inflict any long-term damage against their cause. As long as Washington's army survived, the war could go on. Meanwhile, Howe's decision to abandon Burgoyne during his march to Saratoga would have disastrous effects. Burgoyne would find himself unexpectedly abandoned at the battle as he waited patiently for Howe's army to eventually arrive. General Benedict Arnold would lead the Americans against Burgoyne's forces in the battle which would come to be known as the turning point of the American Revolution. Join us next week as we go over Benedict Arnold's heroic actions at the Battle of Saratoga. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave a like, comment, or subscribe, and as always, never stop learning.